work. Now, long story short, because I have other things I want to get onto, the treatment worked. This is, surprise, surprise, and I make sure I get copies of all my, my scan images. There's one of the lesions on the left side before. That means, if you consider the size of my cross section, cross, uh, my, my midsection, that's a pretty good size tumor that was there. And that little white dot is what was left of it 50 weeks later. And the tumors have con continued to shrink, uh, and the ones that remain are still, are, have, I'm sorry, have been stable uh, and are considered to be dead. So basically, I won. So what do I do now? In January of 2008, as, uh, as Gunther said, my physician, Danny Sands, invited me to join this group he belongs to. Uh, equipped, engaged, empowered, and enabled. E-patients, a different kind of beast. And there's a white paper that, if you haven't read it, this is the white paper that mentions Gunther's contribution as well. It's at the top of the epatients.net website. One key point, this was a mind pop for me. Donald Lindbergh, the head of the National Library of Medicine, said, if I read two journal articles every night, at the end of a year, I'd be 400 years behind. What was a mind pop about this for me was, OK, I can help. It's not a case of the doctors know everything they need to know. I can help. And then this other important point, the lethal lag time, the, the publication delay between the time information comes into reality and the time it makes its way through the publication pipeline, two to five years. And in fact, from the time, from what I've heard, from the time an idea is conceived until the research is conducted and the results are out there can be 17 years. During that time, people can die for lack of that information that exists. The internet can solve this. Doc Tom had this early vision of how access to information would turn healthcare on its head. Uh, this is, these slides are on epatients.net also. The idea here with industrial age medicine before the internet was, uh, if you look at the bottom, the ability to create value, like in the 1800s, the ability to create value accrued to people who owned a factory, right? That was the means of production. But with information age medicine, it turned healthcare on its head. And now what we have, individual self-care, friends and family, the latest Pew Internet uh, research data says that people turn first for healthcare information to friends and family and then to self-help networks like ACOR and then professionals as facilitators. I'll come back to this point of professionals as facilitators. The key is that the internet gives us access to each other and to information that in the past we couldn't get at, and that changes everything when you're desperate. That's participatory medicine, and get this, Doc Tom saw this within a year of the birth of the Mozilla browser. That was an amazing insight to have. He published those slides in January of 95. This point about participatory medicine. This is a post I wrote in December about Stanley Feld, a physician, had written a post called Physicians Are Coaches and Patients Are Players. I won't spend time on it here, but think about this. In reality, physicians advise us on what to do, and guess what? We don't always do it. You know, like I take my medication, yeah, but exercise and eat better, well, not so much. And what you start to see when you give up the viewpoint that they have all the knowledge and power, and it, a lot is up to me as to whether I do what they say, things start to shift. More about that later. Part three of the story, I work in high tech. Software marketing, I've been involved in high tech industries around Boston for my whole career. Uh, this spring, I met Clay Christensen, the author of the Innovator's Prescription and all of the Innovator's Dilemma books. He studies how, has studied for years and has come up with a really world-changing perspective on how new technology changes an industry. And he, his healthcare book was published in February. There are a lot of people who disagree with it. I don't assert that everything he says is the solution. But I want you to think about something that I know from my personal experience is really accurate. In the bottom left is a picture of an archaic device called a slide rule. I used to own one. Uh, and one of Christensen's points is that the centralization of a skill or a technology is followed by decentralization. And here's how that played out in computing. We have here a picture of an old-fashioned computer room. 
the kind of thing where when I was in college, we would take a stack of Hollerith cards to the computer room and hand it in and come back the next day to get our printouts. Highly specialized skills, expensive equipment, specialized environment. As time went by, it got to the point where things were more understood and you could have a simpler, smaller computer in a less specialized area. So you had uh, departmental mini computers. Then it got to the point where we had desktop computers and then ultimately laptops, and now today it's on our hip with a smartphone. These innovations depend on the processes becoming reliable so you no longer need a computer department geek to run the machine, and the data being mobile so it can move around. Now, flip that over. These are diagrams, by the way. These are new slides since the publication of the book, so these graphics are not in the book. The decentralization that follows centralization is only beginning in healthcare, but it is beginning. Here are three pictures of a family doctor like we had when I was growing up who would come to our house. And in the center now, like a computer room, we have the massive general hospital. Now, I'm, I met Christensen at a meeting at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Uh, it was a promotional event they were doing to encourage people to fund research there. And Christensen stood there and looked Paul Levy, the CEO, in the eye and said, the general hospital is not a sustainable business model. It cannot survive without philanthropy uh, and government subsidies. Now that's a pretty challenging thing to think about. Why? I'll get to that in a moment. So here you have, as with computer departments, all kinds of specialized equipment and the general hospital is set up to be able to do anything for anybody. What's happened now is that there are smaller regional medical centers that can do a lot of things that used to require going downtown or to the big centers. Um, now there's more technology in physicians' offices. And finally, more and more things are being done at home with connected health equipment and uh, self-monitoring. And this is only, only beginning. Now, here's a diagram uh, that Christensen used uh, for this metaphor of a general hospital. This is a diagram of a, of a hypothetical a factory, uh, a, a machine tool department that can do just about anything for anyone. So with all these different workstations, a particular product might start at one station and wander all over creation. This is the path taken by product A through this shop. This is what it's like when a patient goes through a general hospital with a complex condition. And here's a different product that goes through a completely different path. Now, I took this and I met with Jason Wong, the co-author of the book, and said, do I understand this correctly? Because I took this and I said, all right, let's say instead of that being an assembly line, let's say this is someone's life. So over on the left side, you have life starts here instead of product A starts here. And this is the path taken by life. This starburst, this is my moment of diagnosis, the moment of awareness. Everything in Christensen and Wong's book is about the delivery of care after the diagnosis, when it's recognized that something needs to be done. What is not mentioned there is that today, with new technology and social networks, values being created outside the hospital walls, outside the healthcare delivery systems. What if this awareness happened earlier in the process? What's the impact of having the information earlier? Well, in my particular case, a kind of a trivial example, I got diagnosed six weeks earlier, so I'm alive. That's an impact that I care about. On the other hand, there are other ways that we could do better and be more aware of our well-being. Making a difference back at this point requires two things. Number one, data, the evidence of what's happening, and the knowledge, the meaning of the data, and what to do about it. And that's the definition of an engaged, empowered patient with participating providers. This is how it goes differently. You're more aware if you have the information and the knowledge about what to do about it. Here's another example of this, and this is Gunther talked about technologies that are out there, and we we're starting to use them, uh, to mash them up in ways that haven't been anticipated. Uh, my, one of the tumors in my kidney uh, was encroaching on the psoas muscle. Now, I had no idea what a psoas muscle was. I went to visiblebody.com, which is this amazing free interactive 3D website. I can't believe they can do this.